Polarization. Have you heard that word before? It's kind of a buzzword, especially if you read the news or you watch news. Um, polarization is, is kind of a big deal, and there's a reason for it. Carnegie Mellon Institute has done an extensive long study over the fact that we as Americans, we're becoming more and more polarized. That term means in its sociological, political sense of a kind of divide. We're becoming more and more divisive. And a lot of us, I'm, I'm probably not saying anything new to, to all of us in, in here. Uh, but polarization has been around from us really from the very beginning. Sometimes it manifests itself in really huge, violent ways. Sometimes uh, countries become polarized to the point where they go to war against each other. And sometimes within, you know, the same country, groups of people can become polarized and there can be a, a civil war. And uh, it can even happen within our own, our, our own families. Uh, a married couple can become polarized and they can get, get divorced. There can be polarization within just siblings where they don't speak to each other because there's deep, profound division and rifts. Uh, so sometimes it's, it can be a big thing and, and probably a lot of us have, have felt that to some degree. Uh, but also polarization happens to us every single day, um, everywhere we go. And to the point, it's kind of low level. We don't really recognize it. In fact, we've kind of gotten used to it and don't even really kind of recognize uh, that we experience it everywhere we go. For instance, right after here, if you go to the restaurant, to, the, you know, to a restaurant, um, when you walk into the restaurant, do you feel a sense of comfort and freedom saying, looking at all the people within the restaurant and going, man, I feel this sense of really deep connectedness with everybody. And so you just kind of grab a chair and you, you find the nearest table and you sit down and you just have the freedom to be able to have this conversation with them. Or flip that around. If you were sitting at a table and some person just kind of felt the freedom to be able to come up to you and your group and they just took a chair and just kind of plopped it right down and started having a conversation. You know, would you feel a sense of just ease in that moment? No, you would kind of sit there and go, that's weird. That's strange, right? In fact, the word strange, you know, comes kind of from the, the Latin word extraneous, which means, you know, external or foreign. You know, for something to be strange, it's, it's, it's external, it's foreign, right? If somebody's strange, they're foreign to us, right? They're, they're kind of external, they're out there, strangers. Strangers are kind of out there. You know, there's this sense that we carry this, this bubble around us of kind of security um, and kind of keeping people at bay. Like for instance, you go to Publix, you can, there could be a couple of hundred people there and, and we can go and get our little basket or whatever and not talk to anybody. We just get our list, we go in there, we can be in there for a full hour. And the only conversation we have is, yes, I did find everything that I need, thank you. And then we just kind of go on our way, right? Um, and so, but you know, we kind of live in this tension or live in this place where we experience this relational strangeness with, with other people. And the word estrange means to, you know, basically to alienate or to no longer be close. That there are going to be people in our lives that were once close that now they're outside of our bubble for one reason or another. And so, but the, the thing about it is, is that it didn't used to always be like this. When God created humanity, he created humanity to not have the weirdness, the awkwardness, the distrust, maybe the anger, the bitterness, or the, you know, whatever, or all these false assumptions and beliefs and thinking about other people and things like that. Uh, when God created humanity, there is a sense of safety and unity with God as the center of that relationship. In fact, when God created Adam and Eve, he said, may they be one, with the Father being the middle of that relationship and the sustainer of the healthiness of that relationship, by which then they would have kids. And in having kids, that, that family then would be one and unified with God the, as father of that family, by which then it would just multiply around the world, by which humanity may not know everybody really you know, intimately or perfectly, but there would not be any weirdness or awkwardness or distrust. There would be just this sense of freedom in our relationships with each other. Um, but then something happened. You know, strangeness kind of came into this world of ours in ugly ways and just kind of sub, kind of weird, awkward ways as well. 
And so what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks, we're going to just ask the question, how did things become strange? What happened that, that made it strange? You know, what makes us strangers? And we're not going to kind of like, you know, we're going to start off and then we'll kind of get to kind of the solutions and how can we become more of a family. But the reason kind of why we want to do this is not to be some kind of Debbie Downer, right? But, but to really just make sense and understanding why we experience life and relationships this way. What's going on within us? I find in my own life that when I have kind of an understanding of that, you know, why do I think this way? What's going on around me? Why is it that way? It helps me then to be able to not just understand things better, but also to help me to be able to make the decisions or the choices that I need to make in order for things in life and God and relationship with God and others not so strange, less strange. And so what we're going to do is is we are going to first, we're going to focus on our relationship with God because ultimately our strangeness with each other begins with our estrangement with God. And... um, You know, there's, there's an epidemic in our own country with fatherlessness, um, and it is having a rippled effect in our own culture. There's lots of studies about, you know, this, this basically sociological pandemic, if, we, if you will, that's in our, our lives and our culture. And there's many studies that show the effects of that. But also, I think some, we don't really recognize, you know, that we also have a fatherlessness issue when it comes to our Heavenly Father as well, that our disconnect from Him has really big effects in our lives and in our lives and our relationships with other people. So what happened? How how did we become strange with God? We're going to look at a passage here in Genesis chapter 3, kind of the epicenter of when that estrangement happened. And then when we kind of look at that, we are also going to see some things about what causes estrangement. What causes our division, if you will, in our relationship with God? And we see that right at the beginning uh, with, with this incident that happened with Adam and Eve. You can, you can flip over uh, your Bible over to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And, but if you don't have it, that's okay. It's going to be in the back or it's going to be on here, um, you know, on the screens and, and whatnot for you. But the first thing I want you to... to to know is that ultimately the biggest issue that creates the the rift between us and God is us really ultimately doubting that God has my best interest in mind. Our biggest estrangement with God is our belief that God really doesn't have our best interest in mind. Now, some of you may be saying, well, wait a minute. I, I do know that God has my best interest in mind. You may have that thought in your mind or, or a theological thought, but here's the thing. Sin in our lives is ultimately a function of our disbelief that God has our best interest in mind. That's what it is. Why do I sin? Because we are all kind of capitalists when it comes to our choices. We're always trying to figure out what's the best choice that would make me the happiest. And so when there is something by which God says, hey, Tyler, this is how I want you to live, and this is what I want you to do, and I go, "Mm, no, it looks like it's actually going to make my life less happy or or less content or less fulfilling, I'm going to live my life this way. Doing that, sinning, is basically, you know, which is what that is, is basically, you know, saying, God, I don't trust that you have my best interest in mind here. So I'm going to make this choice because I believe that if I choose you, I'm going to lose out on something. I'm going to have to sacrifice. My life is going to be horrible and, and, and I'm going to miss out on what seems like is exciting and wonderful things that are happening over here. I think you don't have my best interest in mind. So let's look at that. Genesis chapter three, verse one. Let's go ahead and let's jump into that. So the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. So one day, he asked the the woman, the serpent, which is Satan, asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Well, first of all, you know, the serpent kind of has this, you know, this, 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 um, you know, idea that he's the shrewdest of all the wild animals. And so everything that he says has a purpose behind it. 
So you see right out of the gate, the serpent's first words out of the, to, to man and woman is, did God really say? Right? Now, what is that? That's a phrase of what? It's a phrase to create doubt. Right? Did God really say that? Well, maybe he didn't. Maybe he did. Wait, wait a minute. Let me start thinking about it. Did God really say? And then he you know, phrases it in the negative. He knows what God said. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Did God really say that? Well, what, what did God say? Well, we know before that, before even Eve was created, God, when God created Adam, he gave him, uh, you know, the, the clarity of what, what to do and how to live and function as a creation under the benevolence of God. And so he gave, gives him, and, and God says this to him back in chapter 2, Verse 16 and 17. But the Lord God warned him, warned Adam, you, first of all, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden. Now, so God says to Adam, you can eat freely, man. It's all yours. This is perfect creation, man. Every fruit, everything, it's the best. In fact, it can't be better. As God said, and he looked at his creation, he said, it is good. This is good stuff. There are no worms. There's no rot. It is perfect perfect. You can free, freely eat of everything here except the tree uh, <clears throat> of, of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you will surely die. All right. That's what God said. All right. So Satan asked the question, did God really say that you can't eat, you know, from any of the trees of the garden? Well, no, this is what he said. He said, you know, you can eat freely of, of all the fruit except for this one tree. There's just only one. After that, it's anything. You, can, you just go and enjoy yourself because it is good. This one tree, not so good. Eat the rest, all right? So then Eve goes and go back to chapter 3. Eve says, well, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. So far, so good. She's doing great. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. So, so far, she's like, okay, you know what? We can, we can eat from the, the trees in the garden. It's only that one tree, the one in the middle, that we can't eat. Okay, but here's the deal. This is what you're going to kind of see from this, is she, she's going to add something to what God said, which is another thing that creates doubt within us. You know, doubting God... One of the things that, that creates this estrangement with God is when we, when doubting God, uh, based on what I think he said and what I think he is about. So much of our doubts with God is what we think he says. Well, this is what God said, or think who he is or what he's about without really knowing exactly what did God really say or who, who is God really? We tend to operate in a lot of assumptions about God, which is what creates a lot of havoc and a lot of chaos in our relationship with God. You know, it's not only just with God. We do that in all sorts of um, relationships with other people. You know, we all have these, these, these assumptions that we put on with other people and other people groups without really knowing who they are and what they're about. You know, as a, as a white guy, I can say to, you know, to my Asian friends and to my black friends, hey, this is what it means to be Asian. This is what it means to be black. Tyler, have you ever talked to an Asian or a black person? No, but I know what it means to be Asian, what it means to be black. And, and those of my friends who are different races look at me and go, I don't think so, Tyler. I can sit there and I go, well, this is what rich people think. This is what rich people are about. This is what poor people are about. This is what poor, have you ever talked to somebody who's really rich or somebody who's really poor? No, but I know exactly who they are and what they're about. Gen Z, right? You know, different generations, right? We do this all over the place, but we also do it with God. This is who I think God is. This is what I think God says. This is what I think God is all about. And when we do that, we get ourselves in trouble relationally, right? So next verse here, Genesis chapter three, this is Eve continuing on the, the conversation with the serpent. So she says to the serpent, God said, you must not eat it or what? Even touch it. Okay. Y'all remember Genesis chapter two, verse 16 to 17. 
Did God say anything about touching it? No. That's a fundamental flaw in us. You know, especially oftentimes we tend to think that God is holding back on us. Or we add something to what God said. Or we subtract something from what God said as well. And so she does this. You know, God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. So, so you see here, she's already starting to get things confused about God. You know, God has all these laws. You know, we can't even, we can't eat it and we can't even touch it. Um, yeah, she can. She can go climb the trees. She can go and, you know, whatever. She can touch it. It doesn't matter. But it's to eat it. Okay? But here's the thing. The other thing that creates kind of doubt in our lives is when, you know, is when I believe others and myself more than God when it comes to what life is meant to be. It's when I believe that I know what's, what life is meant to be. Or what gets us in trouble is when I believe what other people say to me what life is meant to be, and I minimize what God has to say what life is meant to be. All right? So we tend to take the opinions of others. We tend to listen to other people without really saying, God, is this valid? Is this true? Is this good? God, this seems contrary to you. What do you have to say about that? But we tend to create this doubt and this, 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 this estrangement with God and this division with him when we kind of go, no, I know what's better for me. And this person, they sound pretty wise. They sound like they, they kind of know what's going on. They, they, they seem like a very confident leader in what they're saying. And so maybe they're right and maybe not so much of God. And so it goes on in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Serpent says, you won't die. You're not going to die. All right, here's, here's the doubt. You're not going to die. And here's the kicker. God knows. Aha! Trickery. God knows something that you don't, and he's keeping it from you. He knows, and he didn't tell you. Lack of transparency with God, right? So God knows. He's been holding back on you. So there's this, they're internalizing, wait a minute, God knows something and he didn't tell us? Wait a minute. What is he keeping back from us? Maybe he doesn't have my best interest in mind. See, God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it and you will be like God. God's keeping you ignorant. He's holding back on you because once you eat of it, boom, man, you are going to be wise. And guess what? You're going to be like God. Yeah. In fact, that's another bit of estrangement when it comes to God and relationships with other people is when we want to be God. We want to be the top dog. You know? And so, and it's interesting when you see this, you will be like God. If you were to go back and go to read, and you can have conversations as, as your family, in your car home, or in your small groups, you go back to, re, to uh, read Genesis chapter 1, you will see that when God created male and female, he created them in his image. We are, when he created Adam and Eve, they were created already like God. They're not God. They image God. We've talked about this before where, you know, if you look at a painting of George Washington, you know, it's, it's not George Washington, but it is an image of him. You, you get the gist of kind of who he was and what he was about in some of that pictures, but it's not who he is. And we do the same thing with God. We are to be kind of this painting that images God out into the world, but we're not God. Why? Well, two, two fundamental reasons. One is we're all finite. We don't know all things. And second of all, this is, you know, this, they didn't know all things, but second of all, post-fall, we're also biased and faulty in our own self-centeredness. So that kind of crows us looking like God. But here's the interesting thing. When Adam and Eve wanted to be more like God, guess what happened to them? They became less like God and more like the serpent, right? And that's where the chaos began because they didn't trust God. They trusted themselves, and now they're listening to serpent and kind of going, okay, well, yeah, okay, well, he seems wise. Maybe God is, you know, holding back on us. This guy is not holding back on us. He's giving us revelation that God is keeping from us. 
He's telling us truth that God has withheld from us. He must be the one that we believe and trust, right? It's kind of what happened here, knowing both good and evil. And then going on from there in verse uh, 6, the woman was convinced. She was convinced. All right, maybe God is holding back because, by the way, that tree is beautiful. And that fruit looks delicious. And if it's delicious, why would God keep me from eating something that is delicious? Ah, he must be on to something about God. And so she took some of the fruit. All right. She took some of the fruit. Boop. She had it in her hand. What do you think was her first thought? Remember, in her mind, right? Truth is perception in her mind, right? And her mind was, if you touch it, you're going to die. So she touches it. And what happens? Nothing. She didn't die. Why? Because God didn't say you can't touch it. Which I think was probably a way that just, you know, made her, aha! The serpent was right. All right? I touched it. I'm not dead. And she goes, it's good. It looks good. It's going to make me wise, smarter, and be more like God. And so she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. So both of them, this point in their lives of recognizing that, wait a minute, you know what? God can't be trusted. In fact, I'm going to trust myself because I can see what's beautiful. I can see what's delicious. I can see what I think is better for me. I can see what would make me uh, more like God and more powerful and more knowledgeable and all of that and then God and, you know, I, I know it's better for me and, and I'm listening to someone else and they're saying, you know, putting these th thoughts in my mind and I'm twisting my thoughts and ideas about God and so here we are. We create this moment of riff in a relationship with God. And so really, ultimately, like I said right at the beginning, distrust and in in its effects are really what alienate us from God. It's our distrust. We distrust him. So at the very core, from the, that very outset, we hold this baggage within us, a sense of distrust with God that keeps us at bay, right? That makes God a stranger, makes him strange. It's the same thing we do with other people. People are strangers, they're strange. We keep them at bay, right? Because we don't really trust them because we don't know. They could be a friend, they could be a foe. I don't know. So let's just kind of keep them away. God, well, you know what? I'll kind of put them in my life. I'll give them some things where I need some help with, but other places I'm not going to trust him because I believe he's going to wreck that and really mess it up, right? And so, you know, we, we deal with this effect of distrust with God. And you see it immediately with Adam and Eve. And so it goes on in here in the next verses here in verse 7. At that moment, their eyes were open. They were open to evil. They've experienced evil. The effects, they become wise in the effects of disobedience. The effects of distrust that creates that, that rift in a relationship between God and between others. And at that moment, they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. First, there was no shame. There's, there's just all this, just this connectedness. We're good. Our relationship with God is good. And, and, and now there's a sense of shame. And what is shame? Shame is a barrier that we feel and experience in a relationship with someone else and with God. So they covered it up, right? So they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. And then verse 8 goes on, and it says, here in verse 8, let's go to that next verse. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So what did they do? They hid. They hid from the Lord God among the trees. This moment of just doing life with God in all of its blissfulness, experiencing God's provisions in all of its grandeur where it's good and it's wonderful, the intimacy with God, and now we're hiding we're hiding from God. And so it goes on in the next verse here, 9 and 10. The Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? 
Does, does God not know where they are? Yes, he is. Yes, he does. He's pulling out of them a confession. He's pulling out of them what's going on inside of them. And so Adam replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was totally exposed. I was naked before you. And then God asks them this pointed question of confession. Who told you that you were naked? You know, you didn't even realize this. You guys were just going through life of just this beautiful innocence between each other and with, with me. So, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The wreckage, ultimately, was not so much of eating a particular fruit. It was, the wreckage was the moment of just distrust to God. Like God doesn't have my best interest in mind. God is holding back. I know what's better for me than what God knows. Other people in my life know what's better for me. And when I'm looking at Facebook and I'm looking at social medias or whatever, and I see people living these lives and whatever, the FOMO is kicking in that I must be missing out and God is keeping me from something great. So now I live a life of distrust with the Lord and I feel this sense of tension within my lives. The beauty of it all is so God didn't just kind of leave us in this state. And it's interesting that we were the ones who, who caused the division, but he in his grace was the one who caused, created the first cause to move back into a relationship with us so we can rebuild that trust that was broken. The beauty of the fact that our God became man, God with us, to pursue us in order to reverse this distrust that we have with him. And by golly, you know, I don't know how anybody could ever gain more trust than us than to take a bullet for us, to jump out in the middle of a car, to be hit by a car so we could live, who in his absolute purity and love took on humanity's ugliness and, and was sacrificed by the ugliness of a power-hungry, distrusting, not understanding God group of people and dying on the cross for the forgiveness of their sins and the forgiveness of our sins and raising from the dead so we can have life eternal. You can't, nobody can build more trust than that. But it's a journey. It's a journey to be able to walk that out with the Lord and to be able to say, God, I wanna know you, but I don't wanna just know about you. I wanna know who you are, what you really have said what you're really about, to listen to you and not create these assumptions on you about what life is meant to be, but you help me to understand with how you perceive and how you understand with your eternal omnipotent, omniscient mind, how life is meant to live, and to be able to live that out. Because Jesus Christ himself, who is God in the flesh, once said, I came to give them life. Life in the what? The fullest, right? The fullest. And that's the beautiful thing. It's like, you know, one of the things about our relationships with each other, our relationship with humanity, really begins with, with building and rebuilding our distrustful relationship with the God who made us. Because it's in that that we begin to see how that begins to affect how we approach our brokenness, our sinfulness and, um, you know, our distrust even within our own culture and how we live that out as an expression of our strength and unity and being deeply loved by our God. In this moment, we're going to have just a moment of response. What I'd love for you to do is you can spend some time right where you're at. We'll have some people at the crosses if you want to pray for, with other people. But I want you to take some time where you are and just say, God, do I really know you? Or do I just think I know you? Do I really know what you're about? Or do I just think I know what you're about? Do I know what you have said? Or do I just think I know what you have said? Just wrestle with that. My hope is, is that the Spirit would just encourage you that the 2024 would just be a journey 
to bring in a closer relationship with God that would just create more trust in you. My hope is that the first step in that would be is that you would go and you would take communion, the stations over here, recognizing that God loves you. Nobody loves you more than, than he does. He knows everything about you and he still loves you. There's nobody like that around. There's nobody who has lived a life selfishly in order for us to have more fulfillment. There's been no president, no emperor, king, politician, uh, business person, uh, athlete who has done that than him. He is trustworthy. And so when you take of the juice and of the bread, that you would just let him just kind of remind you, you can trust me. I love you. I care about you. I don't just say this. I gave my life for you. And if there's anything else that's going on in your life that you would love for other people to pray for, like I said, we'll have our prayer partners right there. And also in the back, we also have our offerings and whatnot to give to the Lord and just say, hey, Lord, I'm going to trust you with the first fruits of what you have given me for the work for your kingdom so other people can experience a reconciled relationship with you, an ever-growing, trusting, intimate relationship with you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have not just left us trying to figure you out. Paul, in his wisdom, when he wrote that letter to the Roman church um, in that first century, I mean, he nailed it, that humanity, in chapter one, when we just kind of thought, you know what, this is what God is all about. I'm, I'm, you know, we thought we were wise in our understanding of God, and when we thought we were wise about you, we were really just foolish. So, Father, I pray that we would just be open-handed to allow you to speak into our hearts and to our minds about who you are. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.